Uh, we started thinking about the ethics of Jesus. Uh, one of the things that uh, is a challenge for us uh, is this issue of uh, does Jesus really expect us to do what he says in his teaching? Right? So this actually becomes a very controversial uh, thing because uh, when, you, when you read what's there and you kind of go, wow, I don't know if I could live that out. Right? So he, mean, he has to mean something else more than he actually wants me to turn the other cheek. Right? He can't mean that. He means something else. And so, uh, so, but it's not just about that. There are broader approaches. And, uh, and so these approaches uh, affect, for example, this issue of, well, maybe what we're talking about here is that, uh, that all we see in Christianity is ethics. So, so, um, so Rockenbush comes around and says, look, the heart of this new reality is the teaching of Jesus and it pervades everything. Okay, and so you end up seeing this idea. You remember the WWJD bracelets? Uh, maybe you have a tattoo. Maybe you can show me after. The, what would Jesus do? And this really came out of this idea of what matters most. The heart of this is what Jesus' teachings are. Okay, uh, this then gets to this idea of the highest expression of the Christian faith. And so uh, here you start seeing replacement theology and the idea that the ethics of Christianity are, are higher than the ethics of the Old Testament. Maybe you've heard people say things like, there, you know, the, the kind of this incipient idea of uh, Marcion, that uh, the God in the Old Testament can't be the God of the New Testament, right, in terms of what's there and those types of things, in terms of uh, uh, the the ban, uh, killing people, those kinds of things. Um, or others say that really what we're talking about here is that which remains in Christianity after the supernatural is eliminated. Remember when we talked about Bhutman and this idea of demythologizing and getting rid of uh, all of the mythic elements and then getting to kind of the core. Well, when we start thinking about Jesus' ethics, that's what we're talking about. Uh, so Harnyak came along and he said, the, the kernel is the life of Jesus. We really want to get at the, what remains of Christianity once we get rid of the supernatural stuff, the husk, the death and the resurrection, because dead people don't come back to life, those kinds of things, uh, then we just really need to focus on Jesus' life. Okay? So, is it the center of Christianity? Is it the highest expression of the Christian faith? Um, kind of this improvement on Judaism? Or is it basically what's the center once we get rid of all of the mythic elements that are there? Well, others say, you know what, that sounds good, but it's actually, um, when we start thinking about uh, the ethics of Jesus, it's, a, it's an impossible ideal, right? So, uh, somebody read Luke chapter 6, verse 36. Luke chapter 6, verse 36. This is a passage that you probably hold dear to your heart. So, Nancy, since you decided to read this, are you merciful to the same extent the Heavenly Father is? Yeah, so we all now know that Nancy is a disobedient daughter of the Lord, okay? All right, so we come to this and go, whoa, really? That cannot mean that. That's got to mean something else, right, than this, because it's impossible. What we see is that Jesus actually thinks that it is possible, for those who hear his words and obey them. Wow. It is possible to be that merciful? Yes. If you've ever talked to my wife, you can find somebody who practices this on a regular basis, uh, living with me. Uh, so uh, others say, in terms of controversy, that this is, this is legalism. Right? You, you start saying that, and now listen, you're just giving me a list of do's and don'ts, things that I have to do. Uh, and does that matter? It's already been taken care of on the cross, right? And so... You come to uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38, the, the Beatitudes, and, and you see those and you read those, and some people say, you know what, that's what you need to do. You need to follow those. And, 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 and then you can kind of see, is this person really a, a Christ follower or not, based on if they live out uh, the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 through 8. And so what happens is that we have these teachings, this teaching about being merciful in the same way that the Heavenly Father is, or living out uh, the Beatitudes. And they instead, instead of something that is, is uh, uh, enlivening and flourishing for the human, it becomes a burden and becomes something that a person is yoked to. And, uh, and so what you have is a resistance to that is basically say this is just a new legalism. 
Uh, others say it's just not practical. Right? This is, it's impossible to do what's there. Uh, if you were to read Matthew 5, 48, it says, Be perfect as I am perfect. Really? God's plan for you is to be perfect. See, that's not happening, so you just give up. Other people come to a verse like this and say, look, you see what's around these verses, and basically these are uh, ancient views that are not relevant for today. And so they just look for ways to set these aside and say they're not practical. So we look for other ways, and we look for other places to develop out our ethics and what it means for us to live life today. So there's a lot of controversies around Jesus' ethics. Well, what we're interested in is, is what we've been talking about tonight and building on this idea of the ethics of the kingdom, right? When you read the parables and they're revealing uh, aspects of kingdom life and we wrestle with what it means and what our place is in that kingdom and what it means for what God had done in the past and continues to do through Israel and now through uh, Jews and Gentiles in Christ, uh, you're, you're, you're put at this place where the ethics of the kingdom are, are brought to the fore. Well, for us, then specifically what we're talking about is eschatological ethics. Now, we, we talked about uh, the now and not yet eschatology uh, in an earlier lecture. Uh, but here, what we're concerned about is that those actions that we do that have the kingdom as a concern. See, I can be merciful in the passage that, that Nancy read and, and not be a kingdom ethic. Because I can simply be merciful. I, I was merciful recently, not to any of you. Uh, but I was merciful to another student. I gave them a grade. They failed the class, and I gave them an A. Okay, I did not do that. So, you know, hoping that's what I would do, right? Um, but uh, you start thinking through uh, what it means to be merciful. Am I being merciful with the kingdom agenda, or am I just simply being a good human being? The same action can be there. One has a kingdom ethic. The other one doesn't. When you come to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 to 20, you have this framework uh, of this existing wisdom for living uh, that, that, uh, that we think of in terms of the Mosaic framework. And uh, what we're going to see is the eschatological ethics that we build from have this earlier framework in mind. And then we've got to figure out what does it mean for us? What does it mean for us? And later on in the, in the course, we get to a, an entire lecture on the law. Right? And what does it mean for us to, are we under the law, or are we no longer under the law? And what do we do with passages like this? Right? When you come up and you're maybe in your mind, you know, Romans chapter 7, verses uh, 7 through 25, and what are those verses saying you know, in terms of those issues? So uh, what we want to think, though, is to think about what does it mean for us to, uh, remember the now and not yet, right? The, those kind of the eschatological, the future spilling back into are present because you can't be merciful. You can't uh, bless those that persecute you, right? You can't do that, right? It's a decision we're going to see. We're not talking about an emotional state. So how are they kingdom ethics? Well, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 11, if we want to turn there, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 uh, to 30 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, we start thinking about kingdom ethics, and, you, and you, the, that whole kind of, this is a new legalism, and people just say, oh, it's too much I got to do. This is the yoke. Jesus says his yoke is light. It's easy. So what does it mean for us to, to live out kingdom ethics? Well, they're ethics that are grounded in God's word. Uh, it's not just me saying, you know, I want to be a good American, I want to be a good Michigander, whatever. I just want to be a good person. No, it's grounded in God's Word. It's motivated by the Spirit because you can't live out the teachings of Jesus in your own power. You are incapable. You can't be more merciful and more loving and more compassionate. That's a work of the Spirit. And it's done out of a love for God. If you're doing it so that you can be seen as a better person, well, that's fine. But that's not a kingdom ethic. It's motivation for a love for the Father. And what it does is it inaugurates the kingdom in time and space. And those little times, those little places, those, those moments where you're more loving and more compassionate and more caring uh, and you, you don't retaliate, 
what you're doing, you're a little beachhead of the kingdom. Right? And it's, it's, so it's not just you making a decision to somehow be a better person. Well, Schweitzer says it this way. When you're a recipient of the gospel, when you've recense, uh, received the gift, that produces a task. And so, uh, so if, if as recipients of the gift of the gospel, the, the supernatural production from that is a task. And that task uh, is detailed in Jesus' teachings. Right? When we get to Romans, we see this in, described as something called the obedience of faith. Right? But it's a sense in which uh, the gospel is a gift and a task. And if you know much about Albert Schweitzer, you realize that this person took this very seriously. Right? That, that understanding what the gift of the gospel meant to him completely changed the trajectory uh, of his uh, career uh, and his, his broader life. Well, the inbreaking kingdom makes these ethics both, both possible and necessary. All right, so uh, now when we start thinking about this issue of the, the ethics of the kingdom being possible and necessary, some people just kind of say, you know what, these are impossible. This gets us this traditional approach that basically says, well, those ethics sound good, but they're for the kingdom. Uh, the kingdom was offered, and it was rejected. And so those, there's a hiatus in these teachings, and now they're really not to be used until the kingdom age in the future. This is why some people say that you shouldn't try to live out the Sermon on the Mount. That that's an ethic for the future. And so some people say that it's only future and that it's not possible to live out what's there anyways. And, uh, and so you can't embody these, so it's wrong to pursue them. Now my guess is, for those of you that are sitting at tables with, a per with somebody next to you, the person next to you probably agrees with this and they don't pursue godliness, so you should pray for them. If you're sitting at a table by yourself, then you're probably the person doing that, okay? <laughs> None of us would do that. None of us would sit there and say, you know what, I don't want to pursue godliness. But you come to a passage like that, and the challenges that are there in terms of what's there and the claims that are being made, and just say, i got to take a pass on that. And others say, you know what, it's a done deal, right? I am saved, and I'm on my way to heaven. There's nothing else for me to do. My guess is there's a lot of people in your mind that come to mind here. If you're in uh, youth ministry, probably most everybody in your youth ministry. This fits them. not kidding. <laughs> uh, so here, you say, you know what? It's not necessary to embody the teachings of Jesus and his ethics because I don't have to do anything. I don't have to do this stuff because uh, I'm, that's it, right? I'm secure. It's all, all taken care of. And if I have to do something, well, that's earning my salvation. So I'm just going to take a pass on this. You can just think about these two issues, right? One that says the teachings of Jesus are not relevant to me. There's some for a future kingdom. Or the one that doesn't, they're not relevant to me because what else is there to do? I'm already on my way to heaven. Both of those produce anemic Christians, right? And uh, so we don't want to be like that. Let's think one quick example. When we start thinking about what it means for us to do New Testament theology, it's to challenge our accepted views about the world and let the gospel speak into them. Now, my guess is, based on what I know about the uh, uh, framework of our students, uh, most all of you are probably pro-life. And I also know that probably the majority of you are also pro-death penalty. And did you ever just wonder if that's okay? Does it make sense to be pro-life and pro-death? Does it bother you? The gospel speak into that? In Relevant Magazine, there's an article on this, and this, this link is there for you in, uh, uh, the, on, on the website in Blackboard, and uh, so you can, you can read it on your own. But it, it really takes you through this and says, you know what, have you stopped to just think? Is there something fundamentally wrong with me claiming to be pro-life, but I'm happy for there to be capital punishment? And what the article goes on to describe, and I'll just do the pull quote down here at the bottom, 
is that many Christians draw both anti-abortion and pro-capital punishment arguments directly from the Old Testament. Right? The same verses. Right? You go verses, say, let's look, look, right, the same passage here. But what's interesting is, what does, if you think about the teachings of Jesus, Matthew 5, 38 to 40, to turn the other cheek, what did that mean? Does it bother you when you're watching the local news and somebody is uh, put in prison uh, for the rest of their life without uh, the chance for parole because we don't have capital punishment here in Michigan? Or do you say, you know what, because that was a heinous crime, I wish that, oh, ooh, I wish that. How did you feel this week when the Jordanians went after, right, in response to? See, there's all these little parts of our life that we say, Lord, speak into it. Now, you should be feeling some tension, right? Because you say, but oh, but what about, is he just going to say, just let them just do whatever? What I'm saying is there's a lot more going on here, right, than just simply saying, oh, I'm just going to say the party line, whatever the party is. Right, because uh, our, our theological, our ideological and political persuasion needs to be brought under the teachings of the, of the Bible. Full stop. Okay, and it's easier for some of us than others uh, because of our background and upbringings. But the challenge for us when we think about doing New Testament theology, at least think through, is there any problem with you being pro-life and then on the one end of being pro-death on the other end? And we won't even get into uh, issues of uh, mercy killing for sick and infirm people. I'd be surprised how many Christians see no problem with that. All right. If you want to know the answer, take my ethics class. And I'm teaching it in the next, this semester, actually. Modular. All right. I'm not going to resolve all the tensions here. I just raise the issue. Right. Uh, all right. That's right. I answer no questions. That's, that's for the other class. All right. Jesus and Judaism. All right. So how does Jesus' uh, ethics reflect his Jewish heritage? Well, what he does is he draws... Uh, from uh, his Jewish heritage, but he expands on it. Uh, so, for example, the Golden Rule. Uh, the Golden Rule is found in rabbinic sources, but it's it's worded in a negative uh, framework. Shabbat 31a says, uh, "That which is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow." And it actually even goes on to describe that that upon this hangs all of the Torah. It's very close to the teachings of Jesus. Okay. Uh, new foundation. Uh, unlike uh, the Rashut, uh, the authority of others, Jesus teaches on his own authority. Matthew 7, 28 and 29. So when you read Hillel and you read other uh, rabbinic sources, they're going to point to another rabbi right, as their, as their uh, authority uh, for, the, for their claim. Jesus doesn't. Right? He builds on his own. And one of the ways that Jesus does this is he, is he takes these antitheses, right? These, these statements. Um, you, so, for example, in Matthew 5, 17 to 48, you have these six uh, prescriptions from Torah. It says, here's what they are, but I want you to do more. In other words, he says, you've heard it said, but I say this. All right, and so, so he's drawing from it, and he expands it. All right, and he and he gives he gives it uh, a kingdom focus um, that uh, that goes beyond the received uh, tradition. Okay, and so that that created problems for people, right? Because he's calling into question uh, received tradition, and if you have a you know a set of uh, frameworks that give you your worldview, and somebody challenges that, it creates problems for you, right? You don't want that person around, probably. You want people that think like you around. All right. So then how does Jesus handle the Old Testament specifically? Well, if we look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 says, um, And from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now some of you might be wondering, uh, is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God the same thing? No, they're not. Have you ever heard somebody say, well, Matthew just says the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of God because he's trying to be polite and not using God's name? That doesn't, it's, it's preaching, it's preachers preaching to each other, 
okay? That's not even the way that would even work. And uh, uh, this is the idea of this transcending element to the kingdom. So when Matthew uses kingdom of heaven, it's not the same as Mark and Luke using kingdom of God. Okay? There's this idea of heaven and earth, and I'll talk more about it later, so I'm not going to do a lot with it right now. But, but I just want you to realize that there's something going on here for Matthew when he uses uh, Hashemayim than, he's, than in comparison to just kingdom of God. So, uh, then it continues. While walking on the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, uh, Simon, who called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. Uh, for Note to self, read the right chapter. Uh, do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have uh, come to abolish, not come, abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say, until heaven and earth, come, earth pass away, not an iota nor dot uh, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness succeeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, somebody read Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. I know it's in the Old Testament. That's why somebody else has to read it. And then Matthew 19, 19, it says, Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So what we have Jesus doing is not doing away with the law. Right? He's fulfilling it. And it's going to be an important issue when we get to Romans, and we get to Romans chapter 10, verse 4. And what does it mean for Jesus to be the telos of the law, the goal of the law? the fulfillment of the law, the end of the law. Which one is it? Okay, And uh, we, want, we want to be able to come back to these verses. And so Jesus summarizes it uh, through the command to love. All right, And uh, so he sums up the law with this double uh, love command. And I know you won't be able to see this too good, but uh, that's uh, you can at least see the colors. So when we come to uh, uh, Mark chapter 12, uh, verse 29 to 31, which is this section here in the middle. It says, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and all of your strength. The second is this, you shall love yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. All right, so Jesus sums up the law with this double love command, right? To love God and love neighbor. All right. What's interesting is when we, when we look at what Matthew does with that, right, you shall love uh, the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. What does he leave off? Strength. strength. Okay, then we go over here to Luke. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind. So the same, but what changes? It just, just switches them, right? So you have mind and strength and strength and mind. Right, and the second of these, okay, here, this is the first commandment, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Right, we go over here to Luke, and your neighbor as yourself. Okay, Matthew, on these two commandments, depend all of the law and the prophets. Okay, so Matthew has a different perspective on, on Torah in some ways than what Luke's going to do. And it says, Luke says, and he said to them, you have answered right, do this and you will live. So what we heard uh, Zach sharing with us tonight is that you need to think about Jesus' intent. We also need to ask the question of where it is in the literary framework and what is going on in the gospel itself. Okay? And so when you do a synopsis, you can compare, you can start seeing uh, what, what their emphasis and what they're, remember, at the end, be able to see what the likely point is. All right? And so, um, so then yellow tells us something that, that Matthew has that uh, Luke doesn't have. And, and, there, and there's a bit of a different uh, setup for each of those. And then the pink is what they, Matthew and Luke share separate from Mark. All right. So what we see then is uh, uh, Jesus 
uh, saying that uh, they sum up the law by love of God and love of neighbor. And so this is the, this is the law of love. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, right, it says, Carry one another's burden so you fulfill the law of Christ. Now, if, you, if you're having a hard time sleeping, I would suggest that you read my chapter on 1 Corinthians 9.21 because it will put you to sleep. Um, but when I talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 9, because if you think about the passage, this is an important passage for this topic, uh, what I suggest the law of Christ is, is the Torah being taken up into the hand of Christ. And we start thinking about that, uh, what we start to see is this idea of a law-free gospel is not what we see in the New Testament. We see a circumcision-free gospel, right? But there, there are claims being made upon the lives of the followers of Christ. And those claims are because the gift produces a task, all right? And so it says, you know what? I'm going to push you so far in this whole idea of what it means for you to love a neighbor is that you need to love your enemies. Okay, this talks about people that say bad things about you on social media or put nasty comments on your YouTube videos like me. It's okay. I'm over it. I can just delete them. So, and I know some of you are probably doing it under a pseudonym. <laughs> so here's, here's the deal on this. Because if you're like me, and when we gave, gave the example earlier, and I know that was rhetorically kind of powerful to think about this in terms of what's going on with the, the, the pilot being burned and everything. We're not talking about emotion. We're talking about decisions. Love acts decisions. Right? That, that when we talk about what does it mean for me to love my enemy, right? it's, it's not that I'm just going to, oh, okay. But it's a decision that I, that I make. Right? And so, so now we've got to figure out, okay, does, does, does the gospel speak into these kind of global uh, nation uh, level uh, issues or not? Well, one thing I will tell you is that Jesus' teachings are not about you individually. So one of the things that ends up happening with Jesus' ethics, they become the ethics for the individual. And what we're going to see when we get to the end of this lecture, if we make it before it's time to go to chapel, is that these ethics are about the community. And so if we're going to live out the ethics of Jesus, we're going to live them out in community. Because you can't do it. You need accountability. You need other members of the body of Christ, others who are reflecting what it means to be the temple of the Holy Spirit that these were never given to help you become a better you, right? A kind of Austinianism, a kind of um, Brene Brown vulnerability gives, makes you create, creative and it goes great for you, whatever. The terrace is this. If you want to get a handle on Jesus and this double, this double love command, is that we need to see this as his hermeneutic for understanding the law. So Matthew... 5, 17, 7, 12, and 22, 40, that you love God and love your neighbor, that unlocks Jesus' understanding of the law. So Matera says this, that Matthew suggests the law as interpreted by Jesus the Messiah is still valid because the parousia is the moment when all things are accomplished. The reason that we say this still matters is because consummation hasn't happened yet. Right? If, it, if consummation has already happened, well, then our gospel on the air has some problems. Or we need to start thinking, it's not just about creation, fall, redemption. But consummation is a legitimate part of what God is doing in the world. And because of that, there are claims that are made upon us because Christ hasn't returned yet. Right? The parousia hasn't yet happened. And so, based on what we saw in Matthew 5, 17 to 20, it still is valid. Okay? Now, my guess is none of you uh, offered sacrifices this week. Right? Something's changed. Right? So what's changed? We've got to figure that out. And we will. Okay? We're not going not to leave you hanging on that. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't want us to, to run by this too quickly. All right. So the main place where we go to get a handle on Jesus' ethics is the Sermon on the Mount. And this is central teaching on ethics. So we have as the indicative of the kingdom that we're justified by faith entails the imperative of the moral life. 
this process of growing in our union with Christ. And this is what I mentioned earlier with the idea of Romans 1, 5. This idea of obedience of faith. And so this is the righteousness that exceeds that of the Pharisees in the verse that we read earlier. Like, you look at the Pharisees and go, how can I be more than they were doing? In some ways, maybe the bar is being set a lot lower, right? Because it isn't about you striving. It isn't about you working yourself up. It's the work of, remember we talked about grounded in God's word, the agency of the spirit expressed because of a love for God. So, Matthew 5.20 talks about what it means for us then to live our lives in accord with God's will. See what happened with the Pharisees who were very important uh, in terms of maintaining the traditions of ethnic Israel is that somewhere along the way, biblical law was superseded with their own uh, accretions and additions to. And those became more important. Now, before we say, yeah, that's right, let them have it, we all do the same thing. Right? What are your little layers of uh, non-negotiables that may don't, don't really hold up when it comes to Scripture? Right? I mean, I used to have my don't now because I'm sanctified, but you all, on the other hand, we started thinking about those. What, what are, what are my, my list, right? So a challenge for us then is to figure out what, what it means for us to live our lives in accord with God's word. And this then is how we figure out what it means to be true Israel. Now, what's funny about this idea, we've talked about it a couple times, is we start using the term Israel. Can I use it without stealing the identity of ethnic Israel? Can I, can I use it in such a way doesn't cause problems. We've been suggesting this idea of the commonwealth of Israel, that we, uh, that we can share in uh, this broader identity as non-Jews. Non Just like a member of the commonwealth of the United Kingdom, somebody that lives in Canada, they're Canadian, but they still benefit from their relationship to the United Kingdom. When T. Wright says, some ways if we can think about what it means for there to be a true Israel, it's those that live in accord with God's will. But he also says this, this is not a private word for you as an individual. It's a challenge for Israel to be Israel. It's a challenge for um, those that are members of the commonwealth of Israel to live out in such a way that it affects others in the world. Paul talks about this in Romans, right? He talks about living in such a way that Jews become jealous. Wow. Let's, let's, let's take the ethnicity out of it. Does anybody uh, become jealous when they see the way that you're living out your Christian faith? <laughs> All right. So what does righteousness mean to Matthew? Because we're going to have to talk about righteousness quite a bit, uh, but I need to, to just lay the baseline here for us. So uh, righteousness in Matthew means right behavior for members of the kingdom of heaven. Okay. When we start thinking about uh, this, people go, oh, that means Matthew teaches salvation by works. No, the kingdom of heaven comes from God. If one lives righteous, it's because the kingdom of heaven has appeared. You cannot live righteously in your own power. You can't do it. All right, so the conflict that's, been, that's often pointed to then is this, is this in, in conflicting then with Paul's view of justification by faith. But well, what we want to say is we have the Stikaiusune word group, right? And uh, what we're going to see is that there's different aspects that can be emphasized in the use of this term. Now, what I want you to know is that, yes, Paul uses the Dikaiusune word group, this D-I-K, just with the, that's the front end of the word, and it gets changed in the end depending on its grammatical category, to depict the gift that God grants to the justified. But Matthew also does that. Matthew, on the other hand, primarily, though, uses dikaiusune as the ethical sense to describe conduct required by those who belong to the kingdom. And what you're going to see in a couple of weeks is that Paul does that as well. Now, you listen to some people, and they're going to tell you that Paul only does the first one, and that Paul doesn't use the term relationally. 
but Paul uses the term relationally just like Matthew does, and Matthew uses it in a more juridical or legal sense just like Paul does. Okay, so you don't need to freak out when you hear of people like Sanders and Dunn and Wright want to talk about relational aspects of righteousness. Okay? We just want to ask a question. What do you mean by that? Right? If you go to Romans 3 and you go, oh, wow, this is like a great place to go, right? Romans 3, 21, 26, all oh, this is 28. This is great. This is justification by faith alone. This is wonderful. And you read right there, right after, and pick up in verse 28, 29, and 30, and all of a sudden, this is about Jews and Gentiles relating to one another. Wait a minute. I wasn't supposed to be there. This just means that I just, you know, I'm no longer guilty. That's great. Okay. What we're going to see is that justification is righteousness. It's being right-wise. It's being set apart. And it's living in such a way that people go, wow, there's something different. You are a member of the kingdom. Matthew 3.15, Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. We start thinking about that, you go, whoa, hold a second. Did Jesus sin? Okay, that wasn't a trick question. Did Jesus sin? No. All right, did say, what? No, he was sinless. Okay, so there's something else going on here. So this verse helps us to see that what this is talking about in terms of righteousness is moral conduct appropriate for the kingdom. All right, if you think about the passage there, it would make sense. There wasn't something deficient in who Jesus was. And the same way righteousness will be used for us to describe a behavior that's appropriate for members of God's kingdom. All right, so what should we do with the ethics of Jesus today? Wow, I'm going to make it. This is pretty good. And now, not yet. You can't divorce them. Right? You cannot live this stuff out fully, but it, the now and not yet dynamic that is there in other areas is there when it comes to living out the teachings of Jesus. The next is the love command. You can't divorce the love command. Because you start going, whoa, hold a second. You wanted me to carry that book for half a mile, but the Bible says I've got to carry another one. Right? No. It's about more than just following that detail. And you don't divorce it from the Old Testament. The Old Testament continues to be an expression of God's will, and it has claims upon your life. You can't be a one-third Christian. You can't sit there and say, you know what? I only, I only follow the New Testament. Well, the Bible says all Scripture is God-breathed, right? And it has an impact. It, it, it can rebuke you, right, for godliness, righteousness. We're going to figure out some hermeneutical issues of how we deal with progress revelation and stuff like that, but the point is, the now and not yet, love command is central, and we don't divorce it from the Old Testament. All right, so if you're looking to do some extra work on this, Richard Burridge on Imitating Jesus is a great book on how to live out the ethics of Jesus. And uh, Scott McKnight's new commentary on, on the Sermon on the Mount, if you're looking for uh, small group study material, uh, ways to really live this out and apply it. Um, uh, Scott McKnight's very good on this topic. And then uh, N.T. Wright is really good in terms of thinking about what it means for us to have a corporate view of Christian character and living out the ethics of Jesus. And so those, those will all be uh, in, in, the, um, in Blackboard for you as well, so you'll be able to get those. All right. Well, it's time to go to chapel, so I will see you all next week.